Okay. Okay. This is a lecture from my third hour class on the uh, 21st of April. Uh, well, anyway, the American people made a decision in 1920. Uh, they were tired of World War I. They were tired of world saving. They were tired of liberal progressivism. They were tired of Woodrow Wilson, so they elected a Republican. And the decade of the 1920s, called the Roaring Twenties, will be a conservative Republican decade. I listed the three Republicans, didn't I? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you start with Harding. He dies in 23. Coolidge takes his place. Coolidge is going to be the president throughout most of the 1920s. And then he's succeeded by Herbert Hoover. And then comes the Great Depression. Uh, not Hoover's fault, by the way, but then comes uh, the, Great, the Great Depression. So America made a big change in the election of uh, 1920. And we will remain isolationist until December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. We literally had to be blasted out of isolationism. But after World War II, the United States stepped out on the world stage and we have never retreated. We've just expanded and expanded and expanded until we have, for instance, and this is just one part of this, we, it's the new American empire. And it's much larger than the British empire. We don't call it an empire. We don't necessarily go around and conquer countries, but we, you know, we have a cultural and military empire that was greater than anything ever established by Alexander the Great, greater than the Roman Empire, greater than the British Empire. It's the American Empire, and it all starts at the end of World War II. Also, get this down. The 1920s was a great decade of fear, okay? People were afraid for a lot of reasons. But the main reason, get this down, the thing that people were most afraid of, uh, was uh, communism. Uh, and the thing that kicked off this great fear of communism, uh, in fact, it's called, get this down, uh, it's called the first great red scare. There's a first great red scare. Uh, first, I should put great there. If there's a first great red scare, you know there's going to be a second great red scare. The second great red scare will come in 1945 after World War II. After World War I, there's the first great red scare. And the thing that triggered this fear of communism was that right in the middle of World War I, get all this down, right in the middle of World War I, the largest nation on earth fell to communism. You know that Karl Marx had predicted that one day communism would rule the world. And in 1917, like I say, the largest nation on earth became a communist nation. And to many people all over the world, and including many people here in the United States, they said, get this down, this is the beginning of the communist revolution predicted by Karl Marx. And so in the United States and in much of the world, but we're talking, about, we're in the U.S. history class, in the United States, in the United States, uh, if you uh, were different in any way, in other words, get this down. If you were not part of the majority, and get this down, the majority in 1921, I think in 1921, WASP, okay? Does anybody know what that stands for, WASP? Some of you are WASP. You look a little WASPish. You look a little WASPish. You do. Let's see. You do. WASPish. Are you different? Huh? No, no, no. I'll tell you what, what. No, you look at your physical characteristics. That's what I'm talking about. I don't mean you have a third ear outside of your head or anything like that. You, Mr. Brillo, look waspish. You look waspish. You do. You do. Is there knock on the door? Yeah. Victoria. The two. Victoria. Yes. And, Oh, yeah, right. Thank you. Um, and you're going where? Uh, the library. I'm just okay. okay. Well, tell them I said hello. Okay. Anyway, if you weren't a wasp, that stands for white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Write that down. You know, we're talking about wasp. Maybe you ought to put your pencil on the paper. That might help your cause. I don't want you to just write down wasp and not have a cotton pick an idea in the world what it is. White, white. I'm not a wasp, but that color, I'm white. They're all, they're all, they're, they're all different stripes and occasions of white people, but some of them are wasps. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants, okay? Uh, what sort of people do you think we're talking about? 
Who are these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? Who are they? If you'll define it, we'll go. Huh? They're from where? England. Yeah, England. Tra trace, trace your ancestry back to England. I can't. I came from Ireland. But different, different stripe of cat. <laughs> uh, but, but, but uh, you know, if you know that great, 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 4,700 greats, grandma came over here on the Mayflower in 1620, there's a good chance you're a wasp. And the majority of Americans in 1920 were wasps. Now, the majority of Americans today, about 60-something percent of Americans are white, but again, there are all sorts of different stripes of whites, okay? Uh, but I'm talking about a particular group of white people descended from England, okay? Right? Grider kind of sounds English to me. Do you know that? Well, go down to the office and call your mother and ask her. <laughs> I'm curious. It sounds Anglo-Saxon. Protestants, not Catholics, right? We know the difference between Protestants, and we know the whole Christian world is divided between. Pro so these are pro these are Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Church of Christ, Unitarians, Episcopalians, Pentecostals, you name it. But they're not Catholics, and the majority of Americans fell into that category in 1920. That's not true anymore. But the majority of Americans fell. And if you weren't one of these people, if you couldn't tra trace your ancestry back to England, uh, a lot of Americans in 1920. In this great era of fear, looked at you and said, you, you may not be a true blue, red-blooded, 100% American. And if you're not that, well, you may be working for the communist or some radical group to overthrow America. And we are going to get rid of you. We'll put you in jail. We'll deport you. But your rights in this country are going to be severely restricted. You understand that when the human animal, us, when we get scared, we're capable of doing horrible, horrible things to each other. For example, World War II. Giraffes didn't start World War II. The human animal started World War II. So anyway, it's a great era of intoleration. Intoleration. In other words, we're threatened with this communism, so we all have to be the same. And if you're not the same, uh, you, may have, you may be un-American. And if you're un-American in the 1920s, you may have problems. Well, the event, get this down, the event that kicked off the Great Red Scare. The event that kicked off the Great Red Scare. Do you have anything in here? The event that kicked off the Great Red Scare was happy, you're welcome. It happened in Boston. Boston, Massachusetts. It was the Boston police strike. Write that down. The police went on strike. The, the police, and by that I mean they refused to go to work. They were not paid very much. And, you know, uh, uh, law enforcement is a vital, necessary job, and it's pretty low pay. I admire those people. It's, you know, they're not paid. They're certainly not paid what they're worth, okay? Um and so these Boston policemen were underpaid. The city of Boston wouldn't even buy their bullets for them. They had to buy their own bullets. So they go over to the city council, and they ask the city council, would you raise our salary, and for God's sake, would you buy our bullets? I mean, we're not asking for health care here for two weeks off in Tahiti. We just want you to buy. And the city council said, no. If you want to be a policeman in Boston, you know, you'll work under these conditions, and if not, quit. And so the Boston police went on strike. And they didn't know everybody called in sick. Okay, what would happen today in Dallas, Texas? I think there are about two million people down there in Dallas, Fort Worth. If none of the police went to work today in Dallas, what would happen in that large city? Yeah. Uh huh? Bad. Yeah, who would basically run and rule the city? Criminals. Huh? Criminals, yeah, you know, the drug dealers, the rapists, the assaulters, the people who assault people, murderers, thieves, you name it. They would have free run of the city. And to get this down, that's exactly what happened in Boston. The criminal element took over. And businesses were broken into in broad daylight. I mean, this big thug just walks in with a pistol to your jewelry store and just has them just put everything in the bag and, and he walks right. They don't do this in the dark of the night. They do it 12 o'clock noon because there's nobody to stop. Uh, and so the criminals took over the city of Boston. And look, Americans reading this in their newspapers, and this is 1919, 
They couldn't listen on the radio because the radio doesn't come around in 1921. But that's how they got their information. If you're sitting in Oklahoma City reading about what's going on in Boston, you think, my God, you know, the whole country's going to hell in the handbasket. In fact, this may be the beginning of a what? What did the Americans think when they saw this city overtaken by these criminals? This, this, get this down. This may be the, by the way, where did the communist revolution begin? It didn't begin out in the country. It began in the big, in the large cities. And they said, this is the beginning of the communist revolution. And I mean, the whole country's watching this unfold day after day. And they're concerned. And it seems like there's no one in charge. Well, write this guy down, Calvin Coolidge. He comes to the rescue. CC, Calvin Coolidge. He was the governor of Massachusetts. What is the capital city of Massachusetts? Boston. He's sitting up there in the state capitol. He's the governor of Massachusetts. And so here's what he did. The first thing he did, get this down, he declared martial law. Martial law. Does anybody know what that is? The military, the military uh, takes over and enforces the law. You know, we had a tornado. We occasionally have them. We had a tornado a few years ago that just flattened more. I mean, just tore it down. And before the debris stopped falling out of the sky, I call them the scum of the earth. Criminals. Thieves. We're going into people's demolished homes uh, and stealing anything that was worth stealing. And the governor declared martial law. You know, the highway patrol go down, goes down there, local law enforcement officials, and, even, and the National Guard. Uh, a couple of years, a few years ago, we had a hurricane called Hurricane Katrina. <coughs> it sunk. <coughs> Pardon me. It sunk about one quarter of New Orleans. And guess what? Think of all that misery, those poor people losing everything they had. But the thieves were paddling through the water in boats, breaking into houses, and they were halfway underwater and stealing everything until the governor declared martial law, the National Guard. Well, that's what Coolidge does. And when, by the way, and more, they said, anybody out at six, after 6 o'clock p.m., you know, if we see anybody out there in this uh, area that's been hit, uh, they're going to be sent to jail. On occasion, people declare martial law, and they say, if you're out after 8 o'clock at night, we're going to, you know, don't, don't be surprised if you get shot. Okay, that's martial law. The military takes over. And that's what Coolidge did. And then get this down. He told those striking policemen. He told those, listen, he told those striking policemen. <laughs> if you're not back, he just said a date certain. If you're not that back by this day, what's going to happen? No, right. you're fired. Get that down. You're, and you know what? Some of them came back, but a good number of them said, he'll never fire us. And what did he do when the deadline passed? Fired he fired him. And boy, he would get this down. He was criticized for that. They said, look, these, these policemen are underpaid. And all they were doing was trying to get a small pay raise and a few benefits. And they're the people who protect you from these criminals. And you, Calvin Coolidge, you understand what I say when he broke the strike? You understand that? He, you broke their strike. They have the right to strike and you broke it. And here's the answer that Coolidge gave. These are probably the most famous words that ever came out of his mouth. Write that down. Coolidge, write it down. Coolidge said, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime, end quote. He said, yes, you have the right to strike. But when you're, are you with me? When your strike threatens the safety of the people, what can the government do? Well, not whatever it wants. What can the government do? If your strike threatens the safety of the people, the government can what? What? They can break your strike. You have the right to strike until you endanger people, and then your right to strike can be taken away. This very much reminds me of a case we talked about earlier involving free speech. You have the right to free speech until what? Your speech presents a what? Well, what did the court say? Famous line. Until your speech presents a what? Clear and present danger. And then your free speech can be taken away. What was the name of that case? We talked about it. The Shink case, okay? Isn't this very much like the Shink case? Yes, yes. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Very much like that. Well, guess what? Get this down. Not, not many people have never heard of Calvin Coolidge outside of Massachusetts, but the next day, his face, his face is on the front page of every newspaper in America. Get this down. He becomes the, the Boston police strike, and, his, you know, you know, and you know what people are saying? Finally, we've got somebody to stand up to these forces that are destroying America. Coolidge is a tough guy. He's a law and order guy. And get this down. That's in 1919. 
The next year, the next year, 1920, we've already talked about this a little bit. We're going to talk about it more. But the next year, 1920, was the presidential election year. And the Republicans, who did they nominate in 1920? Mr. Back to Normalcy, who was that? Harding. Uh, Harding. Harding. So they nominate Harding, but they're looking for a vice presidential candidate. You know, and here we are in this unsettled, fear, fearful time. The Great Red Scare is kicking off. Who'd they nominate for vice president? Adam Coons. Yeah, because he was what? A strong law and order guy. They said, we want to, now listen, just hold him. He's a strong, so they nominate Coolidge. And guess what? In 1920, Harding, Coolidge are elected. And in 1921, they're sworn in as president and vice president. And in 1923, Harding dies. And who becomes president? So, would it be safe to say, would it be safe to say, listen, or would it be correct, not safe, but would it be correct to say that the boss, listen, what I'm going to say here, the Boston police strike, the Boston police strike was Calvin Coolidge of San Juan Hill moment. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Write that down. The Boston police strike was Calvin Coolidge's San Juan Hill moment. Remember that? Teddy Roosevelt storms up at San Juan Hill in 1898. Becomes a world celebrity. 1900s, the Republicans nominate him for vice president. He and McKinley win. And six months later, McKinley is killed. And TR becomes president. San Juan Hill made Teddy Roosevelt president. What made Calvin Coolidge president? The Boston police strike. That's exactly true. The Boston police strike. Okay? Boston police strike. Are you the last one? No, Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So the Boston police strike, Calvin, Calvin Coolidge. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. Any time. Well, so if you weren't a wasp in America, you had problems. Who am I talking about? Get this down. If you were a member, for example, of a labor union. If you participated in a strike, people looked at you and said, that person may not be a real American. He may be starting that labor strike just to kick off a communist revolution. If you were an African-American, if you were a Roman Catholic, if you were a socialist or a communist, if you didn't speak English. And remember the army we sent to World War I spoke 42 different languages. There were a lot of people in this country that didn't speak English in 1920. Or if you spoke English with a foreign accent. People would just sort of look at you and go, hmm, maybe this person is an alien trying to, literally trying to destroy the United States. And so for the first time in the 1920s, get this down, for the first time in the 1920s, you may have gotten it yesterday, but we limited immigration, okay? Uh, there was a fear in this country, get all this down, there was a fear in this country of everything foreign, okay? And if you fear foreigners... You know, if the British fear these Americans, that's xenophobia, fear of immigrants, fear of foreigners, xenophobia, okay? Xenophobia. Fear of foreigners. And so there was a fear that all of these forces were just trying to destroy America, okay? To destroy America. Let me just give you a quick example of how intolerant society was. There was a man, and you don't have to write this down, I'm just illustrating my point. There was a man in Chicago named Frank Petroni. I don't know how much you know about Chicago, but it sits on the southern tip of one of the Great Lakes. And they've got a great beach area out there in Chicago, and people swarm out there to this day in the summer. So there were people out there on the beach in the hot summer, the cooling off, and there was a man named Frank Petroni, and he got into a, you know, you, you always want to go to the beach and get in a political argument, but uh, he did. And by the way, if you go to the beach, you always want to take your pistol with you, you know, have real fun. And he did. And uh, he was arguing with a guy and a guy, and then this guy just became overwrought and angry. And he you know, shook his finger at Frank Petroni and he said, to hell with the United States. And Frank Petroni pulled the pistol out and shot him dead right there on the beach. That's murder. He was arrested for murder. And they take him to court uh, and the jury acquitted him in two minutes. They heard the evidence and they said, nope. You know, he did society a favor. He got rid of that radical who had said, to hell with the United States. There was a socialist named Joseph Yanowski. 
in the 1920s, and he got sent. Just think about this. I'm just trying to paint a picture of, of America in the 1920s. This Joseph Yanowski, who happened to be a socialist, just like I happen to be a Republican, or you may happen to be a Democrat, he was sent to prison for six months for saying in public that Lenin, you remember Lenin, the guy that led the Russian Revolution? Lenin was the most intelligent man in the history of the human race. He said that, and he got sent to prison for six months. Perhaps the greatest example of intolerance, perhaps the greatest example of intolerance uh, were these two men. Write them down, okay? These two men, <clears throat> Nicolo Sacco. Nicolo, what kind of name is that? Nicolo Sacco. Sacco, what kind of, huh? Russian. No, it's not Russian. Nicolo Sacco Basically. and Bartolomeo Benzetti. Italian. Italian. They're Italian. They're Italian immigrants, okay? Uh, you know, in New York City, they've got Little Italy, you know. Um, there may be more Italians living in New York City than there are living in Rome. What did you say? He said, he said Hispanic? Yeah. No, it's not it. Okay. Who are you as attorney? You know, he can't speak for himself. He yeah. hire you to give answers. Okay. Anyway, write these guys down. I don't care about the first name, but uh, Sacco and Benzetti. Okay. And as you can tell, they were immigrants. And these two guys had just about everything going against them. Can you read that? Sacco and Vanzetti, they had just about everything going against them to be in America in the 1920s that you could. Uh, they were immigrants. They spoke very little English, and when they spoke English, they spoke it with a heavy accent. They could be on a subway uh, and speak, and the whole subway would turn around and look at them and say, huh, you know, these guys, maybe they're not true blue Americans. Um they had been in the country in World War I, and when they received their draft notice, they fled to Mexico, and they sat the war out in Mexico. So that's a strike against them, so far as I think the majority of Americans at the time were concerned. Uh, and they're anarchists. That's what they know, the anarchists. And anarchists say uh, there should be no law. There should be no government. Every man for himself. Uh, anarchist. Um well, in 1919, get this down, in 1919, uh, there was an armored car that was held up in Braintree, Massachusetts. Armored car, Massachusetts, held up. And two guard. you know what an armored car is, right? You've seen the armored car, the bank delivering money, okay? It has guards, and two guards were killed. Now listen, there are like in any profession, there are good teachers and lousy teachers. There are good lawyers and horrible lawyers, and there are good policemen and terrible policemen. Uh, I would say in all three of those professions, the balance is to the good, but the, you know, in any large profession, nationwide law enforcement, you're going to get some thug that just wants to go around with a gun and uh, effectively bully people because he's got a badge. It doesn't happen very often, but it does. But it's a dangerous, dangerous job. And to this very day, they're, what the, for what they're asked to do, uh, they are uh, very, very low-paid people, okay? Uh, and when a policeman is killed in, in the line of duty, when the policeman is killed, there's, there's just almost nationwide uh, mourning over that because we recognize that these are people that aren't out to make a million bucks, that uh, they have entered into this dangerous, dangerous profession, uh, to serve society. And when they're killed, there's mourning. Well, there were two, get this down, in this holdup, there were two policemen or guards of this um, armored car that were killed, okay? And as I say, when a policeman is killed, usually, when a policeman is killed, they um, uh, usually, you know, there's, there's mourning and there's anger. Uh, you know, people want so it's a terrible thing that's happened, and people want someone punished. And emotions run pretty high. And when emotions are running pretty high, you have to be very careful, especially when you are in pursuit of someone who has committed a crime, that you are trying to bring about justice instead of what? 
revenge, revenge, okay? There's a lot of times when emotions are running pretty high, people say, somebody's got to be punished. And the first guy they arrest may be as innocent as he could be, but we've got somebody. Okay, I'll just give you a quick illustration here. If we heard some horrible thing that a little first-grade child, uh, today when you were leaving, today when you were going to lunch, you heard this little first-grader had been brutally murdered, God forbid. Uh, and then as you were leaving school, somebody came up and said, they arrested, would they say they arrested a suspect, uh, a suspect uh, that might have killed that child? Is that what they say? Yeah. Is that what they would say? Or would they say, hey, they got that guy that killed that kid? What, what, what were they more likely to say? Oh, they, got they got that guy. Has there been a trial? Anybody been found guilty of it? No, absolutely not. But a horrible crime has been committed, and we want somebody punished. And they just arrest someone. We don't just give them the answer to what. And people would say, they got the guy who did that. No, they arrested the suspect. You understand? I'm just trying to show you a fine line between justice and revenge. Everybody wants, whoever does a terrible crime like that, everybody wants them arrested. They have a trial, found guilty, and then they pay the full penalty of the law. But just because someone's arrested, that doesn't mean that they're guilty. So, anyway. Uh, they arrest these two guys primarily because they don't fit in with the majority. You understand what I'm saying? They arrest them and they have a trial. By the way, the money was never found. In other words, they didn't go to their apartment and root up the floor and say, aha, there's the $100,000. The money's never traced to them. They never found the murder weapon. It's hard. It's hard. You can have all sorts of evidence. Any lawyer will tell you it's hard to convict someone of murder if you don't have two things. Number one, the murder weapon, and number two, the body. Okay. Number two. Well, they had the bodies, but they didn't have the murder weapon. And it was not traced to them in, in, in any way. It was not traced to them. Seven weeks the trial lasts. Think about that. Sit, think about sitting in a jury box down here for seven weeks and listening to testimony all day long. And then you have to go in a room, 12 jurors have to go into a room, and they have to decide the fate of one of their fellow human beings. So how long do you think it would if you were sitting on it, if you were sitting on it, if you were sitting on you, if you were sitting on a jury for seven weeks, how long do you think it would take for you to sort that out in your mind? You'd heard 50 witnesses for seven weeks. How long would it, so you can come to a decision as to whether or not these people are guilty or innocent? How long do you think that would take? I'd forget it all before. Well, well this work with me here, would you? Let's just say you didn't forget it all. You remembered everything that was said. How long do you think that would take you to sort that out? Seven months. Seven months? Okay. What about you? A week. A lot of juries take a week. That's pretty common. Did they take like two, three years to do it? Uh -huh. Two hours. Yeah. Two hours. I bet you they just found them guilty. I bet you're right. And I'm teaching this class. Yeah, you're right. It took them two weeks. Took two, not two weeks. It took them two hours. In fact, think about this. When the jury was going in the, the jury room, there was a news reporter who had been there the whole seven weeks covering this, and he just happened to say to one of the jurors, he said, you know, I've been listening to this for seven weeks, and he said, I don't think they've proven these guys guilty. And the juror, and here's got this guy's life in his hands, the juror, just before he goes in, says, damn them, they ought to hang anyway. And they go in to start their deliberations. And to the surprise of no one, they came out and said guilty. And these two men protested until 1927 when they were put in an electric chair and shocked to death. That's the way we used to kill. Absolutely horrible way. You know, they put a mask over your head because uh, sometimes the voltage causes your eyeballs to pop out. So in absence, and, 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 and sometimes the first, and then they just have to hit it again and again and again. It's so horrible. It cooked them. You can smell their flesh cooking. And they said to the very end, we didn't do it. And most historians today believe that they were right, that they were arrested not because, listen, they were arrested not because of a, what they had done. They were arrested because of who they were. Because in 1920s America, if you didn't fit a certain typecast, you with me? If you didn't fit a certain typecast, your life could be in danger, and that's a perfect example. Uh, right there's a newspaper. So that's how people got their information. Sacco and Vanzetti to die. 
So were they brothers? Or just no, they were just no, they were just uh, you know two Italian immigrants. Okay, right there is a cartoon that came out on August twenty. That's the day they died, August twenty second, nineteen twenty seven, uh, and that's the that's the, the what is that the skull of right there? Statue of Liberty, and there's the death warrant. And what it is essentially saying is that in America, liberty is dead. In America, liberty is dead. Sacco and Vanzetti. Okay, get this down too. Uh, of course, all, in all of this, get all this down. In all of this, you see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan too. I want you to write this down. The Ku Klux Klan was stronger in the 1920s than at any time in our history. You might recall, we talked about this, you might recall that the Civil War ended in 1865 and a year later in a little town called Pulaski, Tennessee, the Ku Klux Klan started, right? And the Ku Klux Klan, the purpose of the Ku Klux Klan was to enforce segregation, to keep the races segregated, to make sure that African Americans never went to the University of Oklahoma, to make sure that African Americans never voted, to make sure that African Americans had no rights. And all of that was encapsulated under this system called segregation. But you also know that 30 years after the Klan was founded, in 1896, there was a Supreme Court case that legalized segregation. What was the name of that case? Um, what? What? Excellent. Advance to the head of the class. The Plessy case. Remember that? Do you remember the Plessy case? Yes? Okay. The so somewhat. Well, the Plessy case legalized segregation. So really, there was no longer a need for the Ku Klux Klan. This is in 1896. There was no longer a need for the Ku Klux Klan. Segregation was the law. You didn't need people to dress up in bed sheets and ride all over the country and terrorize people. So the Klan numbers just started dropping. I mean, it was going out of existence. And then two things happened to bring it right back up. 1912, the first major movie ever produced, the first full feature-length movie ever produced. What was the name of it? What? The what? The Birth of a Nation came out in 1912, and then, get this down, in 1919, the Great Red Scare started. And those two things saved the Ku Klux Klan. Listen, in the, ninth, listen, in the 1920s, the Klan membership's going to go through the roof, especially in this state right here. There was a period in the 1920s in Oklahoma that the majority of our state legislators over in Oklahoma City, making laws in the state legislature, were members of the Ku Klux Klan. A majority. There's a possibility that a majority were. 147 Oklahomans, black, white, Native American, were lynched in the 1920s in this state by, primarily by, the members of the Klan. Get this down. Uh, well, you don't have to get this down, but look, in 1920, 5,000, the Klan had 5,000 members in the United States. That's not very many. 5,000 compared to what it would be. By 1922, just think about this, 1922, there were 200,000. And by 1925, 5 million Americans were members of the Ku Klux Klan. I want to tell you, the 20s, that's the heyday of the Klan. By the way, which state do you think had the most Klan members? Oklahoma. Nope. Alabama. Where? Alabama. No. Tennessee. That's a good guess. Well, Tennessee. Arkansas. 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 No. North Carolina. North Carolina. No. Texas. Uh, Texas. Texas. Yes. No. Uh, Florida. Not Massachusetts. California. California. Not California. Uh, Kansas. No. Virginia. No. Why? What? Why? No. Really? Indiana. 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 Now the reason I say that is look. The reason I say that everybody thinks everybody thinks the Ku Klux Klan they're down in Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, North Carolina. That's a southern dip. Well, it started in the south. But that shows what I'm talking about, that the Klan was nationwide, nationwide. They were all over the country. Uh, there's some Klan women. It's a shame the prom was over. You guys could call them up, but there they are, women, women in the Ku Klux Klan. There, you know, you always see that. There, you know, he's got, he's wearing a sheet. 
This horse has got a sheet at a Klan rally. They always have two things. To this day, at a Klan rally, they always have two things. The American flag and the Holy Bible. Okay? They say they're protected. What's that? Hmm? Well, I mean, but what is it? What's it? What is it? Somebody lost the contact. No, that's a clan initiation. Okay, that's a clan initiation. They're all bowing down before the burning cross to become members of the clan. Look at that. That's the dome of the U.S. Capitol in Washington D.C. Get this down. In the twenties, in the twenties, two hundred and fifty thousand Klansmen marched through the streets of Washington D.C. and crowds gathered to cheer them. 250,000 marched through the streets of Washington, D.C. And the Klan, get all this down, the Klan, in addition now, you know, the Klan gets new life in the 1920s. Uh, because in addition to being anti-black, now, get all this, they're anti-communist. They're going to root out the communists. They're xenophobic. Just a second. There's a, you know, what we did xenophobia, right? Yeah, yeah. They're anti immigrant. Get this down. They're anti Catholic. And they found a really great cause, which will lead to a trial in the 1920s. We're going to do It's called the trial of the century. They're anti Darwin. Have you heard of Charles Darwin? Yeah. What did Darwin do? Mr. Roberts, please come to the office. Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. Write that down. Charles Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. When you get it written down, strike a line through it because it's not true. Darwin, listen, there, the theory of evolution was around Aristotle 2,000 years before Darwin talked about evolution. And what is evolution? It's changed. Let me tell you what evolution is not. Evolution, I don't care how many times you've been told this, evolution is not, well, one day there was a monkey up in a tree, and then he jumped down and put on a bow tie and got a briefcase and started teaching history. The human race descended from monkeys. That's not what evolution says. I want to say that again, because despite my efforts for the last 40 years, most people will go, yeah, evolution, we don't want to teach our kids that, because it's about, it says that the human beings came from monkeys. That is not true okay and i'll talk more about that later but when i you know, i'm not done just hold your horses uh evolution is change you're all young you're, there's a good chance you're all going to live to be 100 years old and you're going to be pretty healthy if i were talking to a group of 16 year olds in 1922 instead of 2022 there's a good chance that you guys would live to be about 50 and you ladies because of constant childbearing would live to be about 40. And that's about it. Well, what's the difference? We've got better medicine, health, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, and we've changed. We've changed. Look at the size of a tackle on the Notre Dame football team, in 19, which was the greatest football team in America in the 1920s. Look at the size of the tackle. We weighed 160 pounds in 1920. Yeah, you'd be an offensive... What, 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 is, what do they weigh today? Oh, they have 350 pounds. They're not human beings. They're mountains. Uh, <laughs> you know, what causes that? You know, we've changed. That's what evolution is. That's all that evolution is. It means change, okay? And Darwin didn't come up with that. Darwin believed in evolution, but Darwin wanted to know what drove that change. What caused that? If evolution is change, what causes the change? And he came up with his own theory. Not evolution, because evolution had been around for 2,000 years when Darwin drew his first breath. Darwin said, it's natural selection. Your, and you've heard of that, your atmosphere, your atmosphere determines who you are and everything about you. That's what drives the change. Does a 16-year-old in school today in Rwanda have a longer life expectancy than you? No. Because they're, you know, it's it's a third world country. The environment they're in is not nearly as conducive to long life as the environment you're in. That's evolution. By the way, how many of you think we ought to teach evolution in the public schools? Keep your hands up. Get a rope. How many of you think we should? Am I in Oklahoma or California? How many of you think we should? So, I'm somewhere in the middle. Oh, 
no. No, the only, th the only thing in the middle of the road are uh, yellow stripes and dead skunks. I'm taking a side. So if someday you're in college, and I assume you will be, and the professor just in passing, just in passing says, as evolution tells us, so you should know what he's talking about. I think that evolution should be explained, but I don't feel like it should be taught as the only correct answer. Well, that's fine. I'm just asking you if evolution, that's what I'm asking you. I mean, evolution ought to be explained. You ought to know what evolution is. You know, yes, I mean, that's all I'm asking you. You know, if you want to believe that we all came from the Easter Bunny, that's fine with me. Uh, there's no scientific basis to that. And you start, I think what you're talking about is uh, what intelligent design and so on, the book of, you know, this is not church, this is school, we ought to teach science. Um, and in your church, they can teach whatever they wish, or synagogue, or mosque, or wherever you go. But yeah, all I'm asking you is when you graduate from high school, should you know what evolution, should you know what Nazism is? Yeah, I've taught that for 42 years. I haven't had a student yet. I haven't seen a student going across the stage at graduation like this. He knows what a Nazi is. In fact, the surefire way to keep someone from being a Nazi is to tell them what Nazism is. I'm just asking you if you ought to know these things. You know, don't be afraid of knowledge. Just because you know what evolution is, it doesn't going to make you believe in it. It might, but it's not. Good morning. Good drive. I want to finish this. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What I am saying, you're all going to advise me, right? Yes. <laughs> What I'm saying is, it's just because you know what communism is, that's probably not going to make you a communist. It might. You might read Das Kapital and go, bingo, that's it. God love Marx, but I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. So don't be afraid of learning things. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to stunt your growth. Well, anyway, test tomorrow. Uh, tell them I kept you. Be quiet. Going down the halls. The lectures for the past, I know I didn't was very much. But yesterday, we were the third post of the Yeah, there are all these are. Okay. This one right now is.